بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستنصره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له ليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله نشهد أنك يا رسولنا قد بلغت الرسالة وأديت الأمانة ونصحت الأمة وكشف الله بك الغمة وجاهدت في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاك اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأنصاره وأزواجه ومن استنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة كل بدعة ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. O oh, praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful. Praise Him who seek His help and forgiveness. We bear witness there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we bear witness that Muhammad is the last and final messenger. Peace and blessing upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, inshallah tonight we continue our journey with the story of the prophets. Last time, we spoke about another great prophet of Islam, uh, which is Prophet Yaqub And after him was his son uh, Yusuf And we finished the story of Yusuf as well And in the previous episode, we spoke about that all the prophets after Ibrahim they are from the progeny of Ibrahim They're all the descendants of Ibrahim And we said, Ibrahim had two children, Ismail and Ishaq, and from Ismail came our, our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and from Ishaq came Ya'qub, and from Ya'qub came the rest of the Prophets. And by the way, the name Ya'qub, he, his other name is Israel, and the rest of the Prophets called son of Israel, Banu Israel. Tonight, inshallah, we, uh, we're going to stop with another great Prophet of Islam to talk about. And uh, I don't think we'll be able to finish uh, his biography, his story in one episode uh, because this particular prophet uh, would, was mentioned uh, a lot in the Qur'an. He was the most prophet mentioned in the Qur'an um, for a reason because there's a lot of lesson to reflect from his story and from his uh, life. He's also one of the Ulul Azmi ibn al-Rusul uh, those prophets with strong will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them extra extra status. It's called Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. Uh, they are Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim, uh, Musa, Isa, and Nuh alayhi wa sallam. They're all the five Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. Tonight, inshallah, we'll talk about our beloved Prophet of Islam, Prophet Musa alayhi wa sallam. Prophet Musa alayhi wa sallam was mentioned many times in the Quran. And most of the time his name was mentioned, was also the villain name was mentioned, which is the Pharaoh. And that's for a reason. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about Prophet Musa in many parts of the Quran, but in Surah Al-Qasas, he spoke in details about when he, uh, Musa salam, was born and what sort of lifestyle around that time when Musa salam, was born. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start the surah with أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طاسيم تلك آيات الكتاب المبين نتلو عليك من نبأ موسى وفرعون بالحق لقوم يؤمنون إن فرعون على في الأرض وجعل أهلها شيعا يستضعف طائفة منهم يستضعف طائفة منهم يذبح أبناءهم ويستحيي نساءهم إنه كان من المفسدين ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين. إن 
the first five ayahs of Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the story of Musa. And this ayah, ayah number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِن نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْ And it's a common thing to, to think that it is Harun is more important than the Pharaoh himself. So it would be uh, common to us to, to, be, to be said Musa wa Harun, right? Because Musa and Harun, the, Harun was his brother and he was his right hand. He was helper and he was also good to him. So, uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to mention the Pharaoh, which is the villain in the story now. Because of the importance of, of the Pharaoh in the story. He's a tyrant, he's an evil person, he's an arrogant person, he refused the haqq, he refused the truth, and he's the one who uh, transgresses against his own people, especially the people of Banu Israel. So it was important to mention him and uh, to, to narrate to the Prophet وسلم, in, in the Quran, Natlu alayka min nabai Musa. وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُونَ the, Those who are, are, are true believers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should know the story of Musa and Fir'aun. Because there's a lot of lessons to extract and implement in our life, even today. And inshallah, I'll draw some analogy between what's hap what happened in the past and what's happening right now. And how the history repeats itself. In, in ayah number 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala straight away start talking about the Pharaoh himself. Describing him. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ Look at the methodology of every tyrant. Wallahi subhanAllah, till today, this still happening. This is pretty much the methodology of all the tyrants. If you want to rule a nation, you need to uh, make, make the hazubat, make uh, uh, people that they have different sects, different, uh, uh, different uh, mentality and get them to do the work for you. And this is what Fir'aun did. He, he made the community, the whole entire community, the whole entire nation of Egypt into small sects, small minorities that each one fight each other. And there's, there's a famous saying in Arabic, Farrat Tasud. If you divide, you will be victorious. This is his methodology. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in the Quran, Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard. Fir'aun has reached the high level of transgression on earth. And imagine, look at the terminology of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on earth. It didn't say in Egypt. Because back then, Egypt was the center of the whole entire earth. Pretty much the oldest one of the oldest civilizations. And this is how... Uh, so if everything happening in Egypt will affect all the neighboring country. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard. Not in Egypt. It didn't say in Mesh. But fil ard, ala fil ardi, wa ja'ala ahlaha shi'a. He made its people into six different, uh, different groups of people. Yastadhaifu ta'ifatan minhum. And he would focus his punishment or his wrath against a minority of them, which is in this case the people of Banu Israel. Yudabbihu abna'ahum that he slaughtered the uh, male children and leave the, uh, the women. And this happened because of a vision. He had a vision that he saw in his vision that um, uh, some male of Banu Israel will take over his throne. And in this case, uh, he asked for advice and they advised him to get rid of all the males of Banu Israel. So now, Banu Israel, I want you to, to remember that Banu Israel were the s slaves, were servants of the Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And he used them a lot in building whatever he used to build. Um, so his, uh, that advice to get rid of all the male slaves, it was, it was threat to the, com to the community, it was threat to the economy. So he need to deal with, uh, with a, a, a much brighter plan for the future. If he get rid of all the male slaves of Banu Israel, who else left going to serve him in the future? So they decided, look at the evil thoughts of the Pharaoh and his people. They decided to make one year for, for the 
people of Banu Israel to have male children. And that year, the, the, the newborn baby boys would be uh, free to live. And the year after, any newborn baby boy would be slain, would be killed. All right? So back to our story of Musa alayhi salam. Harun alayhi salam was born the year before Musa alayhi salam. And in that year, he was spared. He wasn't killed. It was, it was good for him that he wasn't entitled to be killed. But the year after, where Musa alayhi salam was born, it was the year that the Pharaoh and his army go around and kill every newborn baby of Banu Israel. So that will take us to the next part of the story, which is when Musa alayhi salam mother gave birth to, to Musa alayhi salam and how they how, how she reacted to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again in Surah Al-Qasas, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ In the ayah before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of this ayah, Allah says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Referring to the Pharaoh himself, that Pharaoh was among the mufsideen, among those who <coughs> promote evil and transgression against everyone. And the ayah after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ This is the glad tidings to Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of us. When we receive dhulm or transgression, remember this. Remember history. What happened? Pharaoh is the one who says, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى I'm your highest Lord. You pray to me, you worship me. There is no other Rabb, there is no other Ilah except me. وَالْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ He is the one who said that. He is the one who transgressed dhulm against everyone in his community. He is the one who had so much power. So after all of that, what was what was happening to him, or what happened to him after? He died, right? So this is the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. That no matter how long the period of transgression will, will take, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will make the believers victorious. So this is the wa'd, this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every believer, every Muslim. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ And I want you to make an analogy, to reflect on what happened in the past and what's happening now. And we see a lot, pretty much similar to what the Pharaoh used to do to Banu Israel, what now the Chinese government used to do to East Turkestani, our brothers from East Turkestan, right? The minority of, uh, of uh, Uyghur in, in East Turkestan. They occupied the land, they forced people to denounce their own religion, they, f they forced people to not to practice their own simple practices of their own religion. Subhanallah, this, this is happening today. So tyrants still exist in our communities. They still exist till today. Every time you read the Quran, this will bring glad tidings to you. Remember, these verses were, was revealed 1400 years ago to the Prophet ﷺ when he was going through a similar situation, right? He was facing so much trouble. People from his own community denounced him. They didn't respect him. They didn't listen to him. Uh, they tried to kill him. They abused him. So this is a message to the Prophet ﷺ before us that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you victorious. You and the, the believers. And dhulam will never end up in a good position. Dhulm will have a time to be finished. And any dhalim, any tyrant, any transgressor will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will deal with him on the Day of Judgment. This is, this is the message that we all need to learn. وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ صُدْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ Look at the next ayah. Look at more glad tidings. Wallahi subhanallah. If we read the Quran, and the sunnah of the Prophet we will, we will be happy with what we have. Regardless if, if it's hard time, if it's hardships that we face as, as Muslims in this world. And, and remember our, our brothers and, and they are suffering now in, in, in many, many, many places. Kashmir, East Turkestan, Bangladesh, Shishan, all of 
Palestine, Syria, Egypt, all of the, all of the afflicted countries. Remember what happened to them right now. We feel sad, we feel upset about what happened. But we are happy at the same time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us that this will never last for long. This has to come to an end. And this is the message from the Quran, this is the message from the, all the great prophets of Islam. If you read through all the biography of all the prophets, you will find out that every single time, haq, the truth, will prevail, will be victorious. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. That the haq always will be victorious, regardless. But the question is that we need to ask ourselves, are we going to be part of this process or not? Are we going to be productive? Are we going to be, you know, trying to, to, to promote the haq, to say the truth, to help those who are in bad need? Or not. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمَ غَيْرَكُمْ This is another sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you denied everything and you just relaxed and didn't do anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with someone who cares. If you don't care about your brother and sister in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah mentioned in the Quran. And the Quran is the haqq. In ayah number 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُمَكِّنَ لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ ونري فرعون وهامان وجنودهما منهم ما كانوا يحذرون. الله سبحانه وتعالى promised those who stand their grounds to this beautiful deed, try to help the 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 those around them they are in need. Even just promoting the truth, you know, saying the truth to someone who doesn't know about promoting the issue of East Turkestan or Kashmir or any, afflict, any of the afflicted countries, to someone who doesn't know anything about them. This is helping. Right? مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرُهُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطَعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ If you can't change it with your hand, then with your tongue. Promoting the haqq, promoting the truth all the time. We all are ambassadors of this deen. This is not the job of the one who sits right here, or the, one, the imam who goes up to the member and gives khutbah. This is the job of every single Muslim to promote the haqq and the truth and give da'wah. It, it is not just for the imams or the shuyukh. It is for every single one of us to promote the message of Islam. Maybe in a, in a practical way, maybe in a good way. This is, a this is a beautiful deen and it is our responsibility to show the beauty of this deen to all of the non-Muslim around us. وَنُمَكِّنَ لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ وَجُنُودَهُمَا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, He says, spoke about the situation of the mother, the mother of Musa alayhi salam, like any mothers. You know, in the situation like this, you about to lose your child. How are you going to deal with this situation? وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَادُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ In the most authentic narration that the word awhayna here means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to the mother of Musa alayhi salam to tell her to feed Musa alayhi salam and throw him in the river. Now, there's, if you read through the whole story of Musa alayhi salam, you'll see a relationship between Musa and water. First time when he was born, he was thrown in the river, right? His mother was told by the angel, to throw him in the river. And this is a great reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is husn al Allah. This is a good, having a good trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You rely on Allah and have a good trust in Him. And this is the same in the sunnah. You do your best, you do your part, and leave the rest for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The outcome is not for us, my dear brothers. We do our best, but the outcome come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could work hard in this dunya, but we couldn't see the outcome 
We couldn't see a genuine outcome in front of our eyes. You know, you could be studying hard and at the end of the exams or the end of the year, you, you find your marks, you know, P1 or P2. But you, you, you did your best. So the outcome is not from you. It's not because you study hard or not. The outcome is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you were asked, every single one of us were asked to do our best and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is husn tawakkuli ala Allah. You do your best and leave the rest of Allah. And this is what the mother of Musa alayhi salam did. She did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked her to do. She fed the baby. So if he stayed for a longer time in, in, in the river, so he's, he's fed, his stomach is full. After that, is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will provide for him. You don't need to worry about that. From that very moment, you don't need to worry. Ardi'i. And then uh, we know that you fear for him. Imagine someone coming to you and says, you fear for your son, to lose your son, you need to throw him in the river. If someone comes to you and tell you this, what would you do? You say you're crazy. If I fear my I need, I'm looking after my son, I can't throw him in the river. What are you talking about? But she had a full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded her to do. فَإِذَا خِفْتَ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي Do not feel afraid and don't feel sad for losing him because you were never going to lose him. This is the, the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to her. Right? فَإِذَا خِفْتَ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّ رَادُّهُ إِلَيْكِ We'll bring him back to you. Not just that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ We're going to make him among those who are prophets of Islam. So what would you do? You would do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you to do. And look how, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look, Fir'aun was killing every, every single child of Banu Israel. And he was at... Uh, a tyrant, a transgressor. He tried his best to go against the vision that he saw. That one of Bani Israel will, will take over his throne, will destroy his kingdom. Subhanallah. Allah challenged him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach every tyrant to listen. You know, Musa alayhi salam, he grew up in the house of who? A house of the Pharaoh. As Allah says in the next ayah. The household of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, collected the baby with a the bassinet was floating on, in the river. By the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was floating until it reached the palace of the Pharaoh. Stop there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in the heart of the wife of the Pharaoh, which he was a believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises her in the Quran. Till today we recited the verses of the Quran that praises Asiya, the wife of the Pharaoh, because she was a true believer. And she was one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Musa alayhi salam because of the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in her heart towards Musa alayhi salam. وَقَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ فِرْعَوْنَ قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ لِي وَلَكَ لَا تَقْتُلُوهُ The wife of the Pharaoh said to the Pharaoh himself, He is a قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ He is the apple of my eye. I am in much love for him, for this baby. And she was, she was barren. She, she couldn't bore any child. She didn't have any children. لا تقتلوه She commanded the Pharaoh, do not kill this baby. عسى أن ينفعنا أو نتقذه ولدا وهم لا يشعرون We could benefit from his uh, companionship. He could be our son. He could be a great benefit to you in the future. But this is another great lesson we learned from this ayah. You know, they are Egyptians. And from long time ago, 
the Egyptian wife has her own say, regardless. He is the pharaoh, but the Egyptian wife, they are very strong. Those who are married to Egyptians, but the Egyptians and know how strong they are, the Egyptian sisters, mashallah, they're very strong. When they have a say, that's it, it has to be done. Alhamdulillah, I'm not one of them. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But anyway, so yes, so from this we learn as well that she got, you know, her own say over the, the Pharaoh say, you know, the Pharaoh at that year, he, he was entitled to kill any newborn baby boy, but he spared this one. And subhanallah, Allah wants to teach him another lesson. You know, this baby boy that he's going to grow up in your palace under your protection, he's going to be the reason for, your, for the end of your kingship. The end or your destruction. A great lesson, wallahi, subhanallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the status of Musa alayhi salam, mom. The mother, she did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded her to do, but she also did her part. And akhadat bil asbab. She sent her daughter to look for him and see what's happened. So the daughter was following the bassinet and found out that the baby reached the palace of the Pharaoh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا إِن كَادَتْ لَتُبْدِي بِهِ لَوْلَا أَرْبَطْنَا عَلَى قَلْبِهَا لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ As like of every mother's, she was, her heart was broken because of the loss of her son. She was very worried. However, she had a full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect her son. But she, as a mother, she's still, you know, heartbroken that there's a separation between her and the newborn baby. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, she nearly lost it, or she lost her faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabatana ala qalbiha means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed her heart to become one of the believers as well. To have a full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But she said to his, to his sister, وَقَالَتْ لِأُخْتِهِ قُصِّيهِ فَبَصُرَتْ بِهِ عَنْ جُنُبٍ وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ She saw what happened and she went back and told her mom. And now this is God's work. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to reunite the mother and her son. وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِعَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَقَالَتْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ نَاصِحُونَ This is God's work. This is Allah's work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented Musa alayhi salam to, to, to suckle from any woman except his own mom. So they tried with him to bring a, a suckling mother. A nursing mother to take care of the baby, but none of them could be able to do that. The baby refused all the mothers, all the nursing mothers. And then the rule of the sister, she came and told them, you know, I know someone can take care of him. You should give it a go. And you are as a, as a wife of the, the Pharaoh was desperate to find someone to feed this baby, otherwise he's going to die. And she loved him, she wanted him to stay around. So this is the moment the mother of Musa alayhi salam united with her son again. فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ We reunited him with his mother so she can sleep at night and she doesn't feel sad anymore. وَلِتَعْلَمَ أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ And she knows that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ This is a great lesson to all of us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised those who, for example, those who spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah will replace it with even more. And all of us, you know, like this is just one example for sadaqah or charity. Right? الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرَ وَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ وَاللَّهُ يَعِدُكُمْ مَغْفِرَةً مِّنْهُ وَفَضْلًا When it comes to charity, everyone wants to spend, you know, this is our brain act. 
our hearts act. You know, if you take some of your wealth and give it away, this is mean that you lost that money. But in fact, you didn't lose anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this money and invest in it and return it back to you in this life and in the hereafter even more. This is the promise of Allah. But many of us refuse to follow or listen to this promise or accept this promise. They are, when it comes to spending for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are stingy. We don't spend for the sake of Allah. What the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said about sadaqat? This is the promise of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He said, wealth never be decreased from giving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our, our small brain, our small understanding will not benefit us in this situation. We need to look to the, to the bigger picture and remember the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is another example. This is an even greater example, the example of Musa alayhi salam, mother, how she had a full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end she knew that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. If Allah promised one thing, it will happen. So now Musa alayhi salam, after he was thrown in the river and picked up with, with the Pharaoh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed the love in the Pharaoh's wife's heart, then he was reunited with his, with his mother to suckle him and take care of him. The queen summoned a few witnesses to suckle Musa alayhi salam, as we mentioned before, and every one of them couldn't or won't be able to, to suckle him except for his own mother. And that was the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this will take us to after Musa alayhi salam grow and become a stronger man to the next ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَدَخَلَ الْمَدِينَةَ عَلَى حِينِ غَفْلَةٍ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا رَجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ هَذَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ وَهَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ فَاسْتَغَاثَهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ عَلَى الَّذِي مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ فَوَكَّزَهُ مُوسَى فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted Musa alayhi salam good health, strength, knowledge, and wisdom. The weak and oppressed turn to him for protection and justice. They seek his help all the time. So one day in the main city, he saw two men fighting. One was from the people of Bani Israel, the Israelite, who was being beaten by another, an Egyptian. Musa alayhi saw, seeing what happened, he tried to interfere to, to separate them. Because of one of the Bani Israel, the one in, involved in this situation, he asked for his help. So Musa become, uh, became involved in the dispute. And in a state of anger, he struck the other guy heavily so that he fell down and he died at once. Then his heart was full of deep sorrow and regret of what he did. But he didn't do it for like deliberately to kill a person. He was angry that they were fighting and that person was already oppressed and he was trying to remove the oppression from him. So he struck the oppressor a bit harsher and he was stronger that most of us think uh, and uh, pretty much stronger than those around him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him that strength and, and, and knowledge and wealth and health. So he struck him and he fell dead straight away. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described that he regretted it after. He says, when he says, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي فَاغْفِرْ لِي فَغَفَرَ لَهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ قَالَ رَبِّ قَالَ رَبِّ بِمَا أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيَّ فَلَنْ أَكُونَ ظَهِيرًا لِلْمُجْرِمِينَ So his intention was not to kill this person, but he regret. He pleaded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and Allah forgive him. 
and he felt the sense of peace filling his whole being again. Therefore, Musa السلام, began to show more patience and sympathy towards people. So he realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with this power and strength that he need to control and he need to be more patient, more aware of the people around him. And he said, you know, he will not be helper to any transgressor anymore in the future. So the next day, he saw the same person from Banu Israel that he was involved in the fight yesterday. He was involved again. Musa went to him and said, you seem to be, you know, a troublemaker. You have a new dispute again with another person and you have that every single day. So he was a bit upset with him and trying to advise him, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Yesterday I just saved your life and today you are in a similar situation. What are you doing? Which is a common sense that he was say, what he said to him. But the Israelite, he said to him, warn Musa, would you kill me as you killed the, the, the Egyptian yesterday? And then he told, like pretty much announced and told everyone there what Musa a.s. did. So that means he was, he's wanted from the government. He's wanted from the Pharaoh himself and the people of Egypt. So Musa a.s. The next day he was worried. What shall he do in this situation? He, everyone is after him now. فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّبَ فَإِذَا الَّذِي اسْتَنْصَرَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ يَسْتَصْرِخُهُ قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَى إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيٌّ مُبِينٌ فلما أن أراد أن يبطش بالذي هو عدو لهما قال يا موسى أتريد أن تقتلني كما قتلت نفسا بالأمس إن تريد إلا أن تكون جبارا في الأرض وما وما أنت إلا أن تكون جبارا في الأرض وما تريد أن تكون من المصلحين. So that's this is what the Egyptian said to him. And he entered the city as Allah subhanahu wa taala described in the Quran. And he entered the city at a time of unawareness of its people. And he found he found there two men fighting. One of his party, one of his religion, one of the people of Israelite, and the other of the Egyptians. The man of his own party asked him for help against this person. So Musa struck him with his fist and killed him. He said, this is from shaitan doing. Verily, he is a plain misleading enemy. He said, my lord, verily, I have wronged myself, so forgive me. Then he forgave him. Verily, he is the of forgiving, the most merciful. He said, My Lord, for that with which you have favored me, I will never more be a helper for the mujrimin, criminals, or disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he became afraid, looking about in the city, waiting as to what, to what will be a result of his crime of killing when behold the man who had sought his help the day before called for his help again Musa said to him verily you are a plain misleader you are a troublemaker then when he decided to seize the man who was an enemy to both of them the man said O Musa is it your intention to kill me as you killed the man yesterday your aim is nothing but to become a tyrant in the land and not to be one of those who do right. And there came a man running from the f furthest end of the city. He said, O Moses, verily the chiefs are taking counsel together about you to kill you, so escape. Truly, I am to you of those who give sincere advice. 
So he escaped from there, looking about in a state of fear. He said, My Lord, save me from the people who are valimin, polytheists or wrongdoers. So Musa alayhi salam left Egypt in a hurry without going to Pharaoh's palace or changing his clothes, nor was he prepared for traveling. He did not have a beast of burden upon which to ride. So he had nothing. Left his luggage, left his clothes, left everything behind. He was running for his life. That was a situation. He had nothing to travel with. He had no donkey or camel or horse to carry him around. So he just walked. And he was not in a caravan. Instead, he left as soon as the, believers, uh, as the believer came and warned him of the Pharaoh's plans. He traveled in the direction of the country of Madian, which was the nearest inhabitant land between Syria and Egypt. His only companion in this hot desert was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his only provision was piety, taqwa, Allah azza wa jalla. There wasn't a single brute to pick to listen his, his anger, hunger. The hot sand burned the, the soles of his feet. However, fearing pursuit by the Pharaoh's men, he, fo he forced him to continue on. And this is, tell us the situation at that time in Egypt. For Musa salam, to run like this, that means the Pharaoh, regardless of the love and the compassion he had for Musa salam, and the amount of years they spent together in his house, looking after him. And what he heard from the believer, warning him about the chiefs of the tribes or people of Egypt trying to plot against him to kill him. That means this person had no uh, close friends. The Pharaoh himself. When it comes to revenge, he will take his revenge. Even against Musa, alayhi salam, the one who looked after him for many years. I want you to reflect on this part. So Musa salam, escaped to Madian, and when he, when he reached there, he saw two women lining up next to the well to feed or to irrigate. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولما ورد ماء مدين وجد عليه أمة من الناس يسقون ووجد من دونه ممرأتين تذودان قال ما خطبكما قالتا لا نسقي حتى يصدر الرعاء وأبونا شيخ كبير فسقى لهما ثم تولى إلى الظل فقال رب إني لما أنزلت إلي من خير فقير Look at this situation now. Now he escaped, but he's still worried about people following him to this town. He saw a situation where he can be productive, we can give extra hand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with wealth, with health and strength, so he can use this to benefit other people. He saw these two young women, they are puzzled with the situation. They have uh, this waiting in the line and this take effort and strength for women to do. So he offered his help for nothing, just for nothing, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did offer his help to them. He helped them to fill up their water bottles, feed the animals, and then he relaxed after that and after they left. As Allah described it in the Quran, that at that time he didn't even ask for, for money or food in return. He did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though he, is, he was in bad need um, to, 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 to money or to food because he was traveling for a long time. He had nothing to, to lessen his, his hunger. So he could have asked for something in return, but he didn't. That, sh that shows how noble he was, alayhi salam, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So no sooner had Moses السلام, reached the Median than he threw himself under a tree to rest. He suffered from hunger and fatigue. 
The soles of his feet felt as if they were worn out from hard walking on sand and rocks and from the dust. He did not have any money to buy a new pair of sandals, nor to buy food or drink. Musa alayhi salam noticed a band of shepherds watering their sheep. He went to the spring where he saw two young women preventing the sheep from mixing with the others. Musa alayhi salam sensed that the women were in need of help. Forgetting his thirst, hunger and fatigue, he straight away went to help them. So the older sister said, we are waiting until the shepherds finish watering the sheep, then we will water ours. Musa alayhi salam asked again, why are you waiting? The younger one says, we cannot push men. You know, this is a men business, we can't do, we have to wait. Musa alayhi salam was surprised that women were sh shepherding as only men were supposed to do it. And look at the time back then, you know, women still could work and provide for their own family because their father was, was old and he couldn't work. So these two girls were working hard for the family to provide for their family, which is nothing wrong with that. It is hard and, and, and uh, try some work. That's what Musa, Musa salam told them. And one needs to be on the alert. Musa salam asked, why are you shepherding? The younger sister said, our father is an old man. His health is too poor for him to go outdoors to look after our sheep, which is the truth. So Musa alayhi salam offer, when he found the genuine reason for them being there, he said, I will water the sheep for you. When Musa alayhi salam approached the water, he saw the shepherds had put over the mouth of the spring an immense rock that would, could only be moved by ten men, as Ibn Kathir mentioned. Rahimahullah. Musa alayhi salam braced the rock and lifted it out of the spring mouth. This is show how strong Musa alayhi salam was. And now remember the story when he struck that person just to push him away. You know, in a fight, he's separating two people, just push him away. The guy dies straight away. Shows how, how strong was Musa alayhi salam and how much power and strength that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. So he moved that rock that only 10 men can move. So he returned to sit in the shade of the tree after he finished watering for them and their sheep, he returned to his shady spot again. At this moment he realized that he had forgotten to drink. His stomach was sunken because of the hunger. He was very hungry and thirsty. So when the young ladies went back to their father and told him about what happened, they were surprised, and the father also was, just, was surprised. By the name, his name was Shraib, but this is a common mistake to all of us. A lot of us, they think that the father of these two women is the Prophet Shraib, which he is not the Prophet. He's another Shraib from the town of Madian, which it happened to be the same town of Prophet Shraib as well. And that's why the common mistake come to all of us. As according to the majority of the scholars, that this is not the same uh, Prophet tribe. This is different man, but has the same name from the same town. Okay, so this just to clear this uh, before we go further. So when the father talked to them about the incident and what happened, uh, he was pleased and he said, "Can you go and and call him to come and talk to me?" And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala described how bashful and how. Um, shy was the girls of this, uh, this man when they went and asked Musa alayhi salam to come to speak to the father. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَاءَ قَالَتْ إِنَّ أَبِي يَدْعُوكَ لِيَجْزِيَكَ أَجْرَ مَا سَقَيْتَ لَنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them that she came, she came uh, full of uh, bashfulness and shyness asking him, asking Musa alayhi salam to come 
and speak to their father. And it was says in some narration that Musa السلام, refused to go or walk behind the young lady. He said to her, I'll walk at the front and every turn you want me to turn, just throw a rock in that direction and I will just walk in that direction. You don't need to speak to me. Or you, need to, you don't need to walk in front of me to show me the, or lead the direction to me. You can walk behind. So this is also to protect her haya, to protect her shyness and bashfulness. This is the quality of the prophets of Islam. All right. And he went and saw the man. And had a chat with him. But one of the daughters already suggested to their father that he could employ Musa to help them. To look after the farm, to look after the sheep. And in return, one of the daughters can marry him. So helping and the dowry of the daughter of the marriage could be just those amount of years of help. Because they needed someone like him to, to, to help. So the father, uh, the father asked Musa السلام, if he is interested in this offer. You know, and this is another great lesson to all of us as well as fathers. You know, we have daughters, we have sons. We should try our best to choose the best for our daughters. You know, if we know that someone who has good akhlaq, good deen, this is the most important one. Not the one with the, with the, one, uh, with the, you know, the Ferrari and the Lamborghini or the wealth and the ten houses or the mansion no because that could go the next day after marriage but what last is the deen right that's why the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ خُلُقَهُ وَدِينَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ if someone come to you to ask for your daughter's hand and you have good, good akhlaq, good manners and good deen his, his deen is strong then let him marry, regardless of his financial status, regardless of his, uh, his lineage, regardless of his family name, or his, if, uh, whether he's famous or not. Right? If he has a good akhlaq and good deen, you don't need to worry about anything. You ha your daughter will be in safe hands. And the Prophet warned us, if we don't do that, if we don't marry those type of men to our daughters, إلا تفعل تكون فتنة في الأرض وفساد كبير. If you don't do that, there will be a, a big fitna, a big trial. Subhanallah. Look at uh, and and this is also a call for the pa parents that they make it harder for the for, for people to get married these days. You know, someone come with good akhlaq, good good deen to to ask for your daughter hands, but he's still you know. You know, still working his life. You know, he's probably a fresh graduate. He's starting his career. He's not too wealthy to to buy her. You know, the most expensive jewelry, or to buy her the house, or buy her the Ferrari or the Lamborghini. You know, every father wants his daughter to live comfortably. That's this is a fact. But how would you know that if that person who come with the wealth would treat your daughter according to to Allah and His Messenger? How would you know? You need someone you can trust with the deen because you want your grandchildren to grow up with the deen as well someone who treats you do, your daughter according to the, to the deen of Islam so regardless of the wealth or not and this is a, a, a great advice to all of us from the sunnah of Rasulullah from the story of the prophets uh, we should seek you know if we find someone that you can see you know suitable for your daughter there's nothing wrong with you asking. You know, if you want to marry, I have, I have a wife for you, my daughter. And in some cultures, this is becomes like, you know, the evil of all evils. You know, to go and ask someone to marry your daughter, this has become shameful to some, in some cultures, which is wrong. This is, you shouldn't be ashamed of doing that. If I have a daughter and I know someone who is, is, have a good deen and good akhlaq, I would go and ask him if he is interested. And this is the, the, the case in, in, in many cases in the time of the Prophet and the time of the Sahaba, they would do that happily. And this is what Shu'aib did. He asked Musa السلام, to marry one of his daughter and in return he would work for him for eight years and if he completed them to ten, that be, he would be grateful for him. 
you know, eight, and if you want to do ten, then this is something I really appreciate. That's what he said to him. And Musa accepted the offer, because it was pretty much a good offer for him as well. You know, he was running away from people trying to kill him. He had no place to stay. He had no family. He lost everything. He had no clothes to change. So that was pretty much a good offer for him. And in return he was fair, because he would work hard for this person for 10 years. Imagine this is the dowry of one of the daughters. Imagine someone come to you today and he says, you know, you want to marry my daughter? Work for me for 10 years. <laughs> that would be a tough call, right? But he accepted it. He accepted it. As Allah described in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قالت إحداهما يا أبت استأجر إن خير من استأجرت القوي الأمين قال إني أريد أن أنكحك أحد بنتي هاتين على أن تأجرني ثماني حجاج قال إني أريد أن أنكحك إحدى بنتي هاتين على أن تأجرني ثماني حجج فإن أتممت عشرا فمن عندك وما أريد أن أشق عليك ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصالحين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Then there came to him one of the two women walking shyly She said verily my father calls you that he may reward you for having watered our flocks for us So when he came to him and narrated the story he said Fear you not you have escaped from people who are zalimeen and said one of them, the two women, O my father, hire him. Verily, the best of men for you to hire is the strong and trustworthy. He said, I intend to wed one of my, my daughters to you, on condition that you serve me for eight years. But if you complete ten years, it will be a favor from you. But I intend not to place you under a difficulty. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, you will find me one of the righteous. He, Musa alayhi salam, said, That is settled between me and you, whichever of the two terms are fulfilled, there will be no injustice to me, and Allah is surely over what we say. So this is the ten years of the life of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He spent in Median serving Shu'ayb, after he married one of his daughters. The time passed and he lived in seclusion, far from his family and his people. This period of 10 years was of importance in his life. It was a period of major preparation. Certainly, Musa's mind was absorbed in the stars every night. You know, as every man will be always longing to his homeland, like all of us. You know, we miss home most of the time. But by the way, we need to reflect on, 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 on this as well. We're all pretty much migrants. Our children pretty much were born here, or some of them were born overseas. But we live here now. This is our country, and this is what we need to, to feel and think about it as home. You know, Sheikh Amr Abdul Kafi once mentioned in one of his khutbah, that he met a person who lived in the West. And he was praying istikhara for 40 years of shall he go back home or stay here? Imagine 40 years. And this is a hadith from him directly, wallahi. He said, 40 years this person praying istikhara, whether he stay here or go home. And he explained, Dr. Umar Abdul Kafi explained that, you know, your home is where you can find peace for you and your family where you feel peaceful right this is our home we all came here for for a better living right for a better opportunities for a better place to live 
in terms of being peaceful. Alhamdulillah. So, we don't need to think that way that we're here for a certain amount of time and then after we need to go back. You know, and know that most of us, the majority of us, have this type of thinking, and even including myself. For many years, I was thinking the same. You know, I should for a bit and I will go back home. But now I call this place home to me. This place home to all of us. And there is no pressure. You know, there is no way that anyone can push you to leave this country or make you feel that you're not part of it. We should teach our children that you are part of this country. You should be, you know, not afraid to show your heritage, your backgrounds, but also at the same time you should be proud that you, Australian, you're part of this country as well. You're part of the fabric of this nation. And this is something that we need to teach our children. We need to tell them that, you know, you need to feel, you know, safe and secure and also not ashamed of your uh, religion, of your background, or wherever you come from. We hear this all the time from some big bigots that tell people to, you know, go back where you come from. All right? This is wrong and we need to stand together to stop that. Okay? By showing love and compassion, by being productive, by being hard workers, by being good people that provide for others regardless of their religion or race. Showing the good message of this deen. This deen is a beautiful deen, full of peace and love and compassion to everyone. Right? To show love to our neighbors. And, and, and by the way, when, when, when Quran spoke about neighbors, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about neighbors in the Quran, or even the Prophet sallallahu in his hadith, in all the, many a hadith and many verses in the Quran, never ever distinguished between the neighbor, whether he Muslim or not. Wallahi, there's no, there's no distinction between, there's no distinction between a Muslim and a Muslim when it comes to neighbor's rights up on you. ما زال جبريل يوصيني بالجار حتى ظننت أنه سيورثه. This is the hadith of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Jibril kept advising the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم about to take care of his neighbor until the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم thought that after he passed away, the neighbor has entitled, who has the right of inheritance to that extreme, to that level, right? وعبد الله ولا تشرك به شيئا والوالدين إحسانا وبذل القربة والجار ذل القربة والجار الجرب والصاحب بالجنب وابن السبيل. You know even Islam encourages you to be kind to the neighbor of a traveling neighbor. Like you're on a public transportation, you're on a bus or on a train, and someone sitting next next to you on the seat, he has a right of a neighbor upon you. This is what Allah says in the Quran. والصاحب بالجنب وابن السبيل. This is the description. You know, so this is our deen, this is the beauty of our deen, and we need to show this to everyone. We cannot be shy about it. This is, this is our deen, and we need to teach our children to, to have confidence in, in, in showing the, the, the deen to everyone. And I know some of the youth, the youth of our youth, unfortunately, they are confused. They are shy to show their deen. They're trying to mix. They're trying to hide their identity. And this is a big issue in our community now, especially among the youth. Muslim identity is kind of lost among the youth. Some youth are ashamed to show, to, to show their, their religion, or speak about their religion. They're probably ashamed of their names, which represent their culture or their religion, which is sad. But this is our responsibility. As the Prophet says in the hadith, كلكم رائع وكلكم مسؤول عن رأيته. Every one of you is a shepherd, and every shepherd is responsible for his own flock. والله on the day of judgment will be asked about our children. It is a big responsibility, and we need to teach them the love of Allah and His Messenger, the love of Islam, and not to be ashamed to show this in front of anyone. Not to shy away from it. Time. Inshallah. And on this note, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, inshallah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll conclude. Tonight, inshallah, we'll continue next week, inshallah, the story of Musa alayhi salam. Allahumma al-fa'na bima'allamtana wa'allimna ma'yam fa'na wa'azidna ilma. 
اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الاحياء منهم والاموات انك مولانا سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات ورافع الدرجات اللهم ارفع مكتك وغضبك عنا اللهم لا تصل علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا وارحمنا اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في تركستان اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في كشمير اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في الهند اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في باكستان اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم كل اخواننا المستضعفين في سوريا ومصر سائر بلاد المسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم كل لهم ولا تكن عليهم اللهم انصر ولا تنصر عليهم اللهم عنهم ولا تعن عليهم اللهم اشف مرضاهم وداوي جرحاهم وعافي مبتلاهم وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته